Hello everyone, Big Clinky here, and welcome to a bonus episode of my Persona 3 FES series. I've now shown off almost everything that's in the game, but how about what isn't in the game? Yes, it's time for an unused content video. Persona 3 has quite a bit of data left hidden on the disc, so let's get started. Credits to the cutting room floor for a lot of this information and most of the unused voice clips, and credits to Sprite as resource for some unused images and the unused voice clips from Elizabeth. And of course, credit to the Shin Megami Tensei wiki, which is where I get most of my info from for this game. So I'm sure the first thing you want to know is, is there any evidence of any unused personas? Not really. There are a few unused status screen portraits of the three personas used by the members of Strega, Hypnos, Moros, and Medea. It's pretty cool they have full portraits and all, but none of them are actually usable. If you try and hack them into your inventory and summon them, well, neither the protagonist nor I guess in the answer have voice clips for calling out their names, and the game crashes if you try and use them. Speaking of hacking personas into your inventory though, there is one other unused persona portrait that has an interesting use. Meet Placeholder One-Headed Cerberus. This is Cerberus's traditional design from the Shin Megami Tensei series, and in fact it's how Cerberus appears in Persona 4 and 5. In Persona 3 though, they decided to go with a radically new design for Koromaru's version of Cerberus, but this version of it still exists in the game's files. It's used as a placeholder if you try and hack a persona that you're not supposed to have that doesn't really have a working status screen portrait for the protagonist. Namely, if you try and hack Lucia or Juno onto the protagonist's persona inventory, you'll get this as its status screen portraits. On the subject of Persona portraits though, there is an entire folder full of unused cut-in portraits for every Persona in the game. Perhaps they intended to have the Persona itself appear in cut-ins, much like in Persona Q, but in the final game, only the summoner's eyes appear in the cut-in. The only other interesting thing about these portraits is that once again, the Strega Personas have cut-in portraits here, and the cut-in portrait for Orpheus looks very different to its actual artwork in the final game. Every other persona uses its stock art in its cut-in, but Orpheus has a unique one here. I've seen some info floating around on the internet that claims there's evidence of the persona Hachiman being planned to be in the game. Hachiman was a persona in Persona 2 and 4, but it didn't appear in Persona 3. However, I'm a little hesitant to call this true, since I haven't found much evidence of its existence. That's all for the Personas, at least in the Portraits department, but there are a few other unused portraits that are left in the game. Many of these are just early prototypes of the character's dialogue portraits. Of all of these, the only really significantly different ones are Koromaru's, which has a different pose, slightly, and Bebe's, where he doesn't have his fan. Speaking of early mock-up graphics left on the disc, there's a few for early battle UI, some of which is actually taken from Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. Though I'm guessing the only reason it's there is because they might have started off with Nocturne's engine as a base, it being another PlayStation 2 game they developed. But you can also see some early designs for character battle portraits and health bars, which look pretty similar to how they do in the final product, except there's also a generic boy design they have here. The art book shows both generic boy and generic girl designs for characters. These were probably just placeholders while they fully designed the main characters of the game, but according to the art book, it's pretty obvious the generic girl design eventually evolved into Yukari, so that's some interesting trivia. Also interesting is another battle UI mock-up that has sprites not just for one more text, but two more, three more, four more, and five more. Either this counter would keep going up as you got more consecutive turns, or maybe you could have got as many as five extra turns in a row in certain situations. I don't know. There are some more early mock-ups of Battle UI left in the data, but I don't find any of it that interesting, so let's move on to the early map. 
This is a map of all the areas that you can move around in during free time. It looks pretty much the exact same as it does in the final game, except the location names appear as 3D models instead of 2D text, and many of the location names are different to the ones used in the final version. Polonia Mall is Polonian Mall, not a particularly big change. Iwatodai Station is Minatodai Shopping Street. But the ones I find the most interesting are the school and the shrine. Instead of Gekokan High, the school is called Ryoseikan High. Ryosei means star, whereas Gekko means moonlight. So the theme naming is similar, but moonlight fits the themes of the game a lot more, so I guess that's why they went with it. Interestingly though, the Gekko name would have still been used, but as the name of Port Island Station. The shrine, meanwhile, would have been referred to as Kurenomiya Shinto Shrine instead of Naganaki Shrine. Kurenomiya means Dusk Shrine, which would have actually fit the themes of the game a lot more. There are more unused graphics in the game, but a lot of them are just early prototype or dummy textures, but there are a few that are of interest. This is what seems to be an early test for the contract you sign at the start of the game. Except this is actually a certificate of marriage contract. They probably use this as the template for designing their own. There's also a really, really early version of the Welcome to Gekokan High cutscene that's still on the disc. You can probably look this up online if you want to see it. One final thing I want to talk about before we move away from graphics. This one isn't technically unused, but you won't be able to view this part of the model in normal gameplay. So, Chidori's sketchbook. Ever wanted to see what's on it? Well, it's actually a sketch of Tartarus. I'll talk about unused music next because there's actually not a lot for me to say. There are a few unused tracks that are left on the CD, including this one that I don't think is used anywhere in the game, but is actually pretty popular with the fanbase. <laughs> There's also this mysterious fanfare. We have no idea where this song would have played or what it would have been used for, but I have a theory. Now this is completely speculation on my part. I think this may have been intended to be a level up theme. Some Shin Megami Tensei games, like Nocturne or Digital Devil Saga, have a separate song from the normal victory theme played whenever a character levels up after a battle. In fact, here's a clip from Digital Devil Saga of a character leveling up. You might notice the song sounds very similar to this unused track. Can you hear the resemblance? I feel that it might have been intended to have been used this way. Speaking of other Shin Megami Tensei games, there are, bizarrely, a few tracks from the Raido Kuzunoha series that are on the game's disc. Even more bizarrely, they're only there in the FES version, not the original Persona 3. Because of this, I suspect they may have been intended to have been BGM that Fuka can be asked to play in Tartarus. Since Fuka's request BGM system is not present in the original Persona 3, maybe they were intending to do something like they would eventually do in Catherine, having music from other Atlas games available to listen to. 
But here's just a personal note. Is it just me, or does one of the three Raidol Kuzunoha songs that was left on the disc, Strange World, sound a lot like Kamoshida's Palace's theme? The remaining unused songs are just early versions of songs from the final game. Firstly, three early versions of the Tartarus Lobby theme, The Voice Someone Calls. These three sound incredibly unsettling. Next, there's an early version of Master of Tartarus, the Tartarus boss theme. This one doesn't sound too different from the final version, apart from a very different intro. Finally, there's a very early prototype of Burn My Dread. That's all for unused music. Now we come to the biggest amount of unused data in the game, unused voice clips. There are a lot of these, in both Japanese and English. This makes sense, as voice actors are usually given the script without any context as to which lines are used and which aren't, and they have to dub everything they're given. So, firstly, both the protagonist and Igis in The Answer have voice clips for calling out all of the other party members' personas. For example... Hermes! Trismegistus! Hermes! Trismegistus! I think these mostly exist just to prevent the game from crashing if you hack these personas onto them, not to imply that they would have been able to use the other party's personas at one point. The navigators also have quite a few unused voice clips, or voice clips that are technically used, just very hard to hear. Amusingly, both Fuka and Mitsuru have unique voiced lines for if you're using a cheating device. I trusted you. I can't believe you cheated. I'm very disappointed in you. But there are also a few lines from Mitsuru's navigation that never get a chance to be used. One of them is meant to be a story piece of navigation dialogue that plays during the second playable Full Moon, where you have to rescue Fuka from Tartarus. Let's continue searching for Fuka. This line is meant to play at the end of battles during that segment. The problem is that at that point in the story, Mitsuru's communications have been scrambled and she can't talk to you, so you never get to hear that line. More lines of dialogue from Mitsuru's navigation that go unused are lines referring to certain Tartarus bosses. 
Every time you face a Tartarus Guardian, your navigators have a unique line for each Arcana. However, there are three boss Arcanas that you can only fight after Mitsuru stops being the navigator. Mitsuru still has voice clips referring to those three Arcanas, though. I sense the strength, Arcana. This shadow is more powerful than most. Stay calm, and you can defeat this Guardian. Its Arcana is the Hanged Man. This Guardian's Arcana is Fortune, but the battle won't be won by luck. Interesting side note, you never fight a Tartarus mini-boss of the Priestess Arcana, so you'd think there'd be an unused voice clip to go along with that, right? Actually, no. Mitsuru does not have dialogue referring to the Priestess Arcana. It skips straight from Magician to Empress. And I presume it's the same for Fuka, so nice attention to detail there. Speaking of party member dialogue covering situations you'll never see, let's talk about battle voice clips. Every party member you might remember from playing the game has voice clips for if their attacks fail due to an immunity. Strikes are useless against it. Ice is ineffective. But did you know that every member of the party has a voice clip for every element, even the ones they can't use? <sighs> Slash attacks aren't working. <sighs> Pierce attacks aren't effective. It's resistant to fire. Ice is useless, huh? Wind isn't working? It's resistant to light. Darkness won't work? By far the most interesting to me is that every party member has a voice clip for almighty attacks not working. Don't tell me it's resistant to almighty attacks. What? Almighty attacks are ineffective. For those not in the know, almighty attacks cannot be nulled, absorbed, or repelled. So it should be impossible to have a situation where these voice clips play. Or is it? There is exactly one enemy during the storyline that can become immune to almighty attacks, and that's the final boss while it's using Moonless Gown. While in this mode, it repels everything, including almighty. And it just so happens that Spirit Drain is an almighty attack, and Mitsuru happens to learn that. So I decided to test out what happens if Mitsuru uses Spirit Drain against Moonless Gown. This should be the one time in the game that this voice clip will ever play legitimately. Sadly, all my efforts were for nothing. Mitsuru does not say anything when Spirit Drain gets repelled by Moonless Gown. So, this voice clip is completely unused. And to the best of my knowledge, Moonless Gown is the one time in the entire game where an enemy can be immune to Almighty. Here's another interesting set of unused voice clips. These ones all belong to Elizabeth, and they're stored in the same place that battle voice clips are stored. Hello. This is Elizabeth calling. Thank you for your cooperation. The one standing before you seems to have the item I requested. I wish you luck in obtaining it. If you bring it to me by the deadline, I shall reward you as promised. Please be careful. Well then, good day to you. Hello. This is Elizabeth calling. It seems you have encountered the one possessing the item I requested. Please return with the item before the deadline. Your reward will be waiting. Good day then. My guess is that these voice clips related to Elizabeth's request to retrieve certain items from enemies. When you found an enemy that dropped the item that she needed, Elizabeth would hijack your navigation to tell you about it. This was probably removed from the final game because maybe they found it too handholdy. You already had the name of the enemy that drops the item in the request, so maybe they felt this was redundant. But now we come to the real meat of it. There's actually a lot of unused voiced story dialogue in the game's files. Not as much as Persona 4, but it still hints that there were a few scenes that got cut from the story. None of these scenes are anything too substantial, don't worry. Most of them were just early in the game stuff that very easily could have been skipped over without affecting anything, and that's probably why they were removed. 
but I'm going to go and sort of reconstruct these scenes for you. The first one is a scene between the protagonist and Miss Toriumi, your homeroom teacher. This one presumably takes place right after the protagonist is out for a few weeks after first awakening to their persona abilities. So, you're finally back. I was worried about you. I heard you collapsed from exhaustion. I wonder if it's because of all your recent changes, but I'm equally worried about your academics. You missed an entire week. That hurts. Easier said than done. Besides, it's not just your problem. We need a plan. My evaluation could be affected too. Oh well, I'll come up with something. This next deleted scene presumably follows closely after the last one. This is in the dorm where Yukari comes to give the protagonist some study guides from Miss Toriyumi. It's Yukari. Can I come in? Hmm. Did he leave already? Uh, just my luck. Oh, good, you're here. How are you feeling today? I bet yesterday was a little overwhelming for you. But I'm glad you said yes. Oh, I got these from Miss Toriyumi. They're study guides. She made them just for you. You don't feel like doing them? Well, she asked me to give these to you, so make sure you do them. She says this is the most important part of the year. That's why she's worried. Besides, it's partially my fault you missed school. So I feel responsible. So... Here, just work on them, okay? And take it easy. You're still recuperating. Well, that's it. Good luck! Maybe this scene was supposed to explain what the protagonist uses to study at their desk at night. I don't know. Here's another deleted scene from early in the game, just before Junpei joins the team, most likely. So, are you and Yukatan still shacking up under the same roof? Hey! Knock it off! Well, hey, hey, you gotta admit, it's kind of suspicious. A guy and a girl living in the same dorm? <laughs> it makes you wonder. That's because, um, we don't have to explain it to you. <laughs> oh, really? So there's something to explain. <laughs> a little secret, huh? Get your mind out of the gutter. Fine. <laughs> then don't ask me about my secret. Huh? That's right. You're not the only ones with a secret. Sorry, but uh, I can't go home with you today. We didn't ask you to. <laughs> Want to know what it's about? Sorry, can't tell you. Yeah, right. Hey, if you've got something so important to do, then why are you still here? Hurry up and go already. I'm guessing this scene was cut because they already milked this joke for all it's worth in an earlier scene, so we didn't really need it again. Now not so much a deleted scene, but a few cut lines from the first full moon operation against the Priestess Shadow. A motorcycle? Oh man, awesome. These lines were probably cut because Junpei and Yukari had already seen Mitsuru's motorcycle in Tartarus. Next, you might remember when we're climbing the ladder to get into the train, Yukari says... Look up. Originally, there was a line from Junpei afterwards that made what was being implied a lot more obvious. But don't blame me if I happen to catch a glimpse. Unlike the other pieces of cut dialogue, this line was actually added back in in the PSP version. Next is a very short deleted scene where Yukari informs the protagonist that Akihiko is ready for battle again. Oh yeah. Meet me in the lounge when we get back to the dorm, okay? As of today, Akihiko Senpai is officially 100%. We should congratulate him. So, I'll see you then. A few lines were cut from Feroz's conversation with the protagonist on June 12th after rescuing Fuka. Do you remember what I said before about everything coming to an end? Well, I recalled something else. I'm fairly sure that the end is inevitable. I'm guessing these lines were removed because it's a little bit too early in the story to be bringing up that plot point. However, this cutscene seems very incomplete without these lines. In fact, even I was tripped up when I did my playthrough of this game. But it's funny. It doesn't seem so certain considering the vast potential within you. I have no idea what you mean by that. As a matter of fact, your power seems to have changed quite a bit. For this reason, the PSP version added these lines back in. Two lines from Junpei were cut from the beginning of the August full moon operation. You mean it's already been a month since the last mission? Damn, that was fast. And one line from Mitsuru was cut from the day before the November full moon operation. Tomorrow is a big day, so make sure you get your rest. 
Yukari had one of her lines cut from the November 12th conversation on the rooftop, where Yuri Lowenthal flirts with his wife, I mean, Ryoji hits on Mitsuru. Wow, Ryoji-kun, I didn't realize you were that kind of guy. I'm guessing they cut this line because I'm pretty sure Yukari had already seen Ryoji flirt with Igus before. And continuing the trend of single lines getting cut, Yukari lost one line from her conversation with Mitsuru in Kyoto. I've never told anybody, but... Finally, one line from Takaya was cut from the scene after the first form of the final boss. How marvelous. I cannot believe the moment has finally arrived. This is another one of the lines that was added back in in the PSP version. And now to turn back time to much earlier in the game, right after the full moon operation against the Priestess Shadow. The reason why I'm covering this separately is this scene wasn't actually cut from the game. All of these lines do still play out, they're just not voiced. Oh, I have something to tell you. Do you remember how I said Tartarus was divided into different areas? I discovered through Penthesilea's power that the first barrier is gone now. I suspect that the others will disappear too, eventually. Therefore, I'd like to make reaching the top our goal. So, why they decide to make this conversation unvoiced and yet still leave it in the game? I'm not sure. One final bit of dialogue trivia though. So you probably know that this game comes in two versions. The original Persona 3 and the updated release, FES. So, not including the lines that were created specifically for FES, how many lines of dialogue were changed between the two versions? Exactly one. This line is from when Ikutsuki first introduces himself. In the original version, he says, Please forgive the bad pun. While in FES, he says, Please forgive the pun. I guess they thought it was out of character for a pun lover like Ikutsuki to refer to his own puns as bad. And that's pretty much all. So like I said, most of these deleted scenes are nothing too major, and the story really didn't lose anything by cutting them out. One last thing, this video is mostly focused on the PlayStation 2 version of the game, and not Persona 3 Portable, which is a very different game in a lot of regards, but I can at least talk about one element of unused content there that's pretty infamous. So in that game, on the very last day of the game, on a second playthrough, you have the option to choose anyone who you have a romantic social link with, to share one last scene with. There is, in the game's data, still a scene here for Junpei, even though he is not a romantic option for the female protagonist. But this scene seems to only exist with Japanese voices, so I'm guessing they never got around to dubbing it because they knew that you wouldn't be able to see it in the game anyway. You can easily find fan-translated versions of this scene online, but beware of spoilers, obviously. And with that, that's all I want to talk about when it comes to Persona 3 FES's unused content. There's not a lot that suggests scrap gameplay mechanics, but I find a lot of the deleted scenes kind of interesting. I hope you found this video interesting, and I'll see you again next time.